You're listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, a production company specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, festivals we're attending, and how to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk. And now, enjoy Factual America with our host, Matthew Sherwood. Welcome to Factual America, a podcast that explores the themes that make America unique through the lens of documentary filmmaking. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and each episode is my pleasure to interview documentary filmmakers and experts on the American experience. Today, we're talking about risk. (laughs) Risk, yes, as a society, uh, and certainly as American, we seem to be quite worried people. We worry about what we eat, the air we breathe, the strangers we might meet. I think broadly, we're afraid of succeeding and afraid of not succeeding. So without further ado, I want to introduce my um, my first guest here is uh, Dr. James Lyons. He's Associate Professor of English at the University of Exeter. So welcome, James. Thank you. Well- uh, those uh, our avid uh, followers at uh, at home will notice that uh, we're speaking of risk. We're shaking things up a little bit. We're at a different studio. We're coming to you from Soho in London, England, and we're going to change the format slightly. That's uh, me taking a risk. And uh, the other reason, uh, well, I just needed to take a pause to get some breath because there's a lot to talk about here in terms of. Uh, Dr. Lyons and your background. So welcome again. Uh, you're the author of several books and articles, uh, one called Selling Seattle, which the New York Times uh, said is a, a visitor ought to read to truly understand the American cities and regions where they live, work, and travel. But we're not talking about that. That's okay. Uh, another article, Think Seattle at Globally Specialty Coffee, Commodity Biographies, and the Promotion of Place, also featured, was in Cultural Studies, cited in the New York Times. Uh, you're one of the first scholars to analyze Starbucks power as a global brand, but we're not talking about that either. Uh, so Miami Vice is a book you've written. Uh, one reviewer described it as the richest account of a single television program I've ever read. Uh, we're going to have to do an, a, a podcast about that sometime, but we're not talking about that. But, 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 but before I go any further, I have to ask you one question. Crockett or Tubbs? Such a difficult decision. Such a difficult decision. Is uh, that a false decision? Yeah, I think so. Always both, I think. Always, Always both. both. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. All right. Um, research interests, uh, role of the producer. Uh, I think you have a chapter called The American Independent Producer in the Film Value Chain. We're not talking about that. Although I know uh, Emmett, our producer, and Sebastian, our executive producer, I think will be very keen to talk to you about this. And uh We'll have to meet up for a drink sometime. What we are talking about is uh, your research, recent research that looks at modes of performance and discourses of risk, explores how some of the most significant recent American feature documentaries use performance to dramatically animate major categories of risk. You've done work with Rubber Republic on a doc about risk in everyday life. You can see that. I highly recommend it. I watched it. It's uh, risktakersguide.com. Uh, winner of the uh, Ramias or Ramijas, depending on where you live in the Latin world, I guess, Interactive Fund Award at the Sheffield International Doc Fest. And your latest book, and we're finally getting there, everyone who's listening at home, Documentary, Performance and Risk. And again, welcome to the show, James. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. How do you do that? all that? It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time. Uh, that's been done over a number of years yeah. and uh, just kind of working steadily at each project and trying to get it right. Okay. <laughs> uh, it reminds me when I was a, a kid, those people back in the States who are old enough to remember this, uh, they used to do these ad. US Postal Service had these adverts for people who they'd like be astronauts and sports ser- players and things like that. And then they would ask them, what do you do in your with your free time for <laughs> excitement? And they'd go, I collect stamps. <laughs> it kind of so I do wonder what you do with all your free your copious amounts of free time. Um, so again, we're going to diverge a little. We usually dive in straight away into the um, into the film that you're going to be or the films I should say in this case that we'll be discussing. But uh, I'm your student. Our listeners are your students. Uh, Performance and Risk 101. What is what is this research about? Oh, it's really uh, trying to sort of place those three topics or subjects together. So documentary and recent trends in documentary. And my specific area of interest is American independent documentary. 
um, with the increased prominence of performance within documentary over the recent decades as well. Mm. The idea that performance has become such a powerful and important part of documentary, particularly commercially successful documentaries, that we're looking for those kind of gripping and compelling performances mm. um, in front of camera. Um, with an examination of risk, and risk is something I think I've been interested in most of my life mm -hmm. as a subject, um, but it's something that I think uh, has really come to the forefront in terms of how it's been used to shape some of the most compelling documentaries. Mm -hmm. So it's really an attempt to try and understand how those three things go together. So how documentary is informed by some of the major ideas about risk in our society mm -hmm. um, and how it often, not always of course, but I think in many of the most successful and interesting instances, uh, harnesses performance to really enable the audience to understand risk, mm. to give them ways to kind of see risk in action, I guess, and to okay. see risk embodied. And then to illustrate this point, we've, uh, we always ask our guests to choose a, a documentary film. You've chosen two. We've let you get away with that. Thank uh, you. You're, you're welcome. Uh, the first um, is, um, well, it's a, it's a biggie, An Inconvenient Truth from 2006. Director is Davis Guggenheim, uh, director of three of the top 100 of highest grossing docs. Uh, of all time, won two Academy Awards. Uh, your listeners, you probably know it was Best Documentary, but who can name the second one? Because I had no clue. Uh, I'll give a pause while you're having debates at home. Uh, best Original Song. Had no clue. <laughs> anyway, and we're also talking about an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Pet. So the sequel to An Inconvenient Truth, and which came out in 2016. So why'd you choose these films? Well, I mean, I think, you know, Climate change is arguably the most pressing issue of our time. Mm. Um, and in Incon Inconvenient Truth, the first documentary was really, I mean, th I guess the most high profile and important documentary example of that on the big screen. Mm. Um, so it's, I think it's one of the most important and certainly one of the most successful and critically acclaimed documentaries of recent decades, certainly yeah. the most important to represent climate change. Um, and I also think it really speaks very clearly to my thesis about mm. performance and risks. I think those things are absolutely the heart of why that documentary works and why it's a compelling experience for the audience. Um, and an inconvenient sequel, I think I wanted to add uh, to talk about as well, because I think in many ways, as the title implies, <laughs> it, tends, it, it, it intends to pretty much follow in the footsteps of the first documentary. Um, Partly it's, it was made because the kind of change that Gore was seeking hadn't happened, actually. So that's why the follow-up exists. But also, it wasn't as commercially successful. It wasn't as widely seen. And there are lots of reasons we might get into those, okay. I guess, about why that is. Um, but I think it also it speaks very, I think, importantly to the kind of the ideas I'm interested in in terms of performance and risk as well. Okay. I think uh, to help um, further illustrate this, uh, you, I know you've also picked some clips for us. Thank you so much. Uh, the first one uh, is very, very early, right into the right at the beginning of the film, I think um, uh, roughly around the first 30 seconds or so. And um, it's, um, well, actually, maybe before we go into that, uh, maybe give us a little synopsis of the films because... Uh, I mean, mo we assume most people have probably seen this, but, uh, you know, just for those who haven't. I mean, An Inconvenient Truth was often sort of um, critiqued when it came out because it was Al Gore presenting this slideshow that he'd been traveling around, mm. not just America, but traveling around the yeah. world presenting this slideshow that he'd been yeah. diligently putting together on his uh, on his MacBook. Yes. Um, and so, and so the, the An Inconvenient Truth was, in a sense, an opportunity for a wider audience to to see that slideshow and and to have that experience in a in a theater but it's but it's cut together and i think this is, was the key part for me in terms of my interest as well it was cut together with a, a series of vignettes and those vignettes dive into gore's uh, thought processes yeah. and they dive into his past mm -hmm. his, his kind of personal recollection of his childhood um the moments when he, he became really aware of climate change and, and why that was important. Um, and so it was really how it sort of intercuts those vignettes that I think creates the structure. So you have the, you have the, the PowerPoint slideshow yeah. and then you have the vignettes. Yeah. And that's how it kind of, and the kind of intersperses those. And I think if you were doing a pitch to a, 
to a studio and say, we've got this uh, documentary about a guy giving PowerPoint slides, and we're going to talk a little bit about his childhood. You think that would have... <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Absolutely yeah. not. And particularly with Gore as well, because he had been, I mean, obviously he was a, a controversially unsuccessful yes. um, presidential candidate. Yeah. But a lot of the criticism of him on the campaign trail was that he was very stiff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the idea that his performance was very stiff and this and stilted. Yeah. Um, and so what I thought was really interesting about the documentary is bringing in the idea of his kind of stiffness yeah. and how the film actually, I think, mobilizes that, uses it very compellingly. He becomes almost like the this kind of slow globe. He's kind of embodies yeah. the idea of the planet and has this sort of planetary mm. kind of, you know, gravitas. Yes, yeah. Um, and so that idea of him being kind of this immovable objects, if you like, which was a real, obviously a real, of a de detrimental impact on the campaign trail. Yeah. Within the context of the documentary, that, that really works. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think, well, as a, as an aside, because we're not going to be discussing, in terms of these films, it's not about gore. Well, maybe, well, but we'll get a little bit more on that later. But, um, and it's, we're not even really going to be talking too much about the environment. But one thing that struck me as a, certainly as an American watching this and who had followed the 2000 election quite closely mm. was, why didn't he channel this, you know, in 2000? He would have, he would have won. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can think of is that he is, I think, whatever you think of him, he's legitimately passionate about this. And I think for us, all of us as individuals, if you're passionate about something, you will, it will come across. And he, he, yes, he is a naturally stiff <laughs> fella, but uh, he doesn't come off as wooden, I would say. He, he believes this, he lives it. And I think that comes across uh, loud and clear, actually. Yes, I would absolutely agree with yeah. that. Okay, so now, now let's go see that clip. You look at that river gently flowing by. You notice the leaves rustling with the wind. You hear the birds. You hear the tree frogs. In the distance, you hear a cow. You feel the grass. The mud gives a little bit on the riverbank. It's quiet, it's peaceful. And all of a sudden, it's a gear shift inside you. And it's like taking a deep breath and going, oh yeah, I forgot about this. This is uh, the first picture of the Earth from space that any of us ever saw. It was taken on uh, Christmas Eve 1968 during the, the Apollo the 8 mission. Within relatively comfortable boundaries. But we are filling up that thin shell of atmosphere with pollution. So James, talk to us about that. Why why did you choose that uh, clip, and how, what does it illustrate about the work you're doing? Well, I think it says so much about what makes the documentary successful, actually, mm -hmm. and why that idea of embodiment is so crucial. Um, it's really about Gore giving this kind of monologue where he's quite sort of putting it. It's like a guided guided imaging CD meditation, <laughs> meditation <laughs> CD rather. <laughs> um, was trying to put you in that place, really, um, by that riverbank yeah. in Carthage. Yeah. Um, so it's um, partly what it's about doing is really listening to his voice as well. And what's absolutely crucial, I think, to how that little scene works is you become very aware of his breath mm. and the idea of breathing. And of course, which hurt him during the campaign. Right, actually, right. there's a debate where he got a lot of criticism for his size and for things his like size, that. Absolutely. But, yeah. Yeah, and but the sighs here are absolutely perfect. Yeah. They're apposi, and they work. And that sighing and that sense of his breath and breathing, which comes across so powerfully in that sequence, um, is crucial to the way in which this, the film itself sort of mobilizes that idea of breathing. And of course, it's the imperiled air that we're all breathing mm. through climate change, which is right. so crucial. And kind of sets up a way in which the film uses that idea of breathing and imperiled breathing in different sorts of ways so there's another scene where his uh, he talks about his 
sister Nancy dying, yes. dying yeah. from, uh, lung, from cancer. lung cancer. Yeah. And of course, that's again, it's breathing and imperiled breathing. And his family had had a tobacco yep. farm right. and he had worked farm. on it. And exactly. this sort of exactly. tinge of, so it almost sounds a bit guilt-ridden, his, his voice. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, yeah. he's very torn by that, I think. Um, you know, there are, there's, there's some evidence that um, his campaign, at least some, some of his campaigning at some points were funded by tobacco money as well. Yeah, so true. there's some... Yeah. Yeah, it's been corroborated. Um, so clearly, he's conflicted about this. But also, there's a, there's a part in the film where he talks about his son being hit by a car, mm -hmm. and of course, about his kind of imperiled breathing after this uh, kind of horrible risk risk event. Yeah. So I think you know, in terms of how the film is really trying to get us to think about imperiled breathing and imperiled air, this is the first and I think really powerful way of sort of focusing us in on that idea and that sort of trope. Mm. Um, and it uses it, I think, very effectively. And if you don't mind, I'm going to interject there just sure. because um, I think what I think this contrasts with. Uh, uh, we're not going to actually play it, but I do recommend people look up both films when you um, go to watch them. Look, look at the trailers first, because these trailers are just absolutely almost in the other direction. They're like, uh, you think you're about to watch a natural disaster movie, an action film. Certainly the second one, some of those scenes of the, um, the uh, Greenland ice fields, it looks like something, you think it's CGI maybe. Um, I expect Bruce Willis to come in, and maybe go and go to the Paris conference and kick some butt and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's the way the, the, the clips, you know, the trailers yes, are. And then you yes. get into these, uh, certainly the first one especially, I would say is a much, much calmer, just sort yes. of a, let me just present the facts to you. Yes. And this is very important, I think. And I've done some work. I did some work for the, the government chief scientific officer's report yeah. um, about how to communicate the risk of climate change. And I, I used an inconvenient truth as an example there of one of the ways in which what one is trying to avoid there really is that sense in which these issues are completely, completely impossible for us to solve. Mm. And so... The idea of the environmental catastrophe, and it's interesting yeah. that the, the trailers kind of cue that up in yeah. some ways. That, the idea of the environmental catastrophe, that the, the problem with that, and this is what climate, a lot of climate change communication experts will say, is that it makes us feel powerless. Yeah. There's nothing we can do. This, this issue is too big. Um, and so one of the things that you know, experts try and do is combine that clearly, that sense that this is a compelling and important and yeah. major issue with what might be everyday acts that we can that we can undertake as individuals, that we can make a difference. Yeah. And I think one of the things that the film does very well is it, it's able to kind of reconcile those things. It's able to reconcile the global scale, the mm. catastro catastrophic global scale of right. what's going on there with that sense in which we can be empowered as individuals yeah. to make a difference. Let's hold that thought and we will go to a break. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases and upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests and the team behind the production. And now, Back to Factual America. Uh, welcome back to Factual America. Uh, James, we were talking about uh, about an inconvenient truth, an inconvenient, uh, well, mainly about inconvenient truth, but, uh, yes. you know, we're also there's an inconvenient sequel, which we've uh, discussed briefly. Uh, and I know there's a clip there that you want to talk about that helps uh, further illustrate these, this point you're making. Um, so it's a, a clip where... Uh, Al Gore is in Paris for the uh, it's ahead of the Paris conference. That's right. That's and right. Uh, I'll I'll hand it over. To, well, actually, why don't we see the clip first, and then we'll uh, discuss it when we, once we're done. He asked us to bring your car over by the trailer just in case. Need to get you out of here in some point. Okay, is it, a, is it terrorist related? They, they don't Probably know yet. Because there's, there's several shooting around the Paris. City. There's uh, several dead people. Oh, and no. uh, so it's pretty sure it's terrorism. Police officials in France say there's been an explosion in a bar near a Paris stadium and a shootout in a Paris restaurant. President Hollande evacuated from Stade de France. And there are apparently 18 dead, and AFP is reporting hostages at the concert hall. Hostages? Yes. 
That's all coming from police. Oh. Terror fear. Multiple people are reported killed in a shooting. There's also word of possible explosions. Paris is under an effective police state. Our curfew is in effect. Police don't seem to have a full handle exactly what's going on. But this is exactly the kind of uh, terror scenario that the U.S. has long feared. Okay. Before I go on to make my statement, I just want to say something. Those of us who are Americans stand with you. We uh, express our heartfelt condolences for the tragedy here in the city and in your country. This uh, scourge of terrorism in our world um, we have to defeat this. But we have to defeat it not only with force of arms, but with the force of our values caring about the future and doing what the world needs to do. But uh, for now, I, I just wanted to say to all of you, especially those of you from France, uh, what's in my heart is in the hearts of all the Americans here who love you and care about you and stand with you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are suspending our broadcast because of the tragedies that have unfolded here. All right. Well, that's, I guess that's illustrating your point, although it has nothing to do with the environment, does it? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Um, I mean, what I, why I think that's interesting and why I chose it um, is because, you know, this the, the sequel wasn't as successful. It didn't create the kind of wave that the original did. And maybe that's not a surprise because many sequels don't. And many, yes. many films that are, you know, a, su a surprising success, well, yeah. you try and repeat that success and it doesn't work. So I think, you know, maybe there's nothing surprising in that. But I think that we can, we can point to some very specific reasons why I would argue that that film, the film is less successful as a film, as a documentary, and maybe less compelling for audiences. Yeah. And what it does do, I think, is it tries to, it does recreate many of the key tropes, the key moments, the key, the key mm -hmm. ways of telling stories that we get in the, in the original. So yeah. we get that, you know, he goes to hit the family farm in Carthage. Exactly. We get bits of the slideshow, this time updated with new slides. Um, better graphics. Better graphics. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Um, so we get all that stuff and that's all great. Um, but what we don't get is the thing that I mentioned was, was, was this kind of series of vignettes of mm -hmm. his past. And I think there are very good reasons for that. I mean, he was rather resistant, reluctant to having these in the first film in the first place. Is that right? He didn't really want them in there um, for various reasons. Um, but they're not in the second film. And you could say, well, they've just kind of run out of stuff. They've just, they've exhausted, you know, those moments in his past that were, yeah. that were risky. Yeah. that would work in relation to the film. Yeah. Um, so I think what is interesting is the one moment in the film, in the, in the sequel, where you really get that sense of personal jeopardy, of that right. idea of right. that uh, the embodiment of that risk is the moment where he gets caught up in the Paris attacks. Mm. He's in Paris for, for, the, for the 2016 climate change accord. Um, and the, the attacks take place take place and they're worried about him being in Paris and yeah. do they have to kind of move him to a safe space That's right. and it's that moment I think that really brings home the idea of there is there is the sense in which this is a, this is a risk that occurs on a global scale and at this moment you're talking about ISIS and you know mm. attacks could happen anywhere they are unpredictable right um, and that you could get caught up in it at any moment and so it becomes a sort of analog and, and in some ways, it just dawned on me, it just references the first film, because he even goes in that first film, because it's 2006, think about the time period. Yes. Uh, you know, we've had a Afghanistan, Iraq war, Iraq war is still going on, actually. Yes. And he's he's saying, you know, yes, I know we've got to fight terrorism, but here's what is this, here's the real existential threat. And then now, 10 years later, 
yeah, people probably think it is more the real ex- existential threat, but who, where is the threat actually coming to him? Yes. It's it is actually terrorism. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And um, you know, the first film really, it really is a post nine eleven film as well. Yes, uh, in many so. ways, in many ways, a post nine eleven film, uh, and it, it talks about the kind of the imperiled predicament of of New York actually, and mm. it uses the idea, right. uh, the, you right. know, the idea that the kind of it, it could get flooded, and but yeah. but where is it going to get flooded to? It's going to get flooded up to where the World Trade um, Center mm. memorial is, right? Mm. So that's where the flood waters could yeah. rise to. Um, so it, you know, the sequel is able to kind of mobilize some of those elements in a slightly different way, but reconfigured around this idea and this moment, which I think is in many ways the most compelling moment, the most mm. kind of um, Certainly, the moment of greatest a great sense of kind of physical jeopardy is mm-hmm. where you know you, he may get caught up in this. And do you think so? This gets us more into sort of the uh, the this 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 mode of of uh, documentary filmmaking, mm-hmm. if you will. It's um, I mean, so you made reference uh, two things there. You make reference early, just a few minutes ago that uh, you know Al Gore is a bit resistant to these little vignettes, and I'm watching this and I'm thinking. You know, sometimes I'm thinking, is this isn't actually about the environment? This the first one, especially, mm-hmm. uh, is this is about Al Gore. Uh, at the same time, part of me is thinking it should have been a, you know, they could have used that as a on the campaign trail of that film, yes. these little vignettes. It would have made him a more real person mm-hmm. to a lot of people. Uh, so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying, uh, in that sense, are these films effective? You know, do people lose sight of what they're about? I mean, potentially, potentially. I think they can spill over, I think, yeah. into being sort of um, about the cult of a personality and about just that individual um, and being driven by that personality. And I guess a good example of that would be someone like Mer- Morgan Spurlock. Right, um, right. Um, you became know, the, Mac- the f- Mac- guy, the McDonald's guy, basically. Right, or right. The anti-McDonald's the guy. The anti-McDonald's guy. Yeah. Um, but... You know the criticism of him post Super Size Me, which yeah. was an incredibly successful documentary, was that his films just became too wrapped up in the Spurlock persona, yeah. and they lost sight of what it was that they were trying to do. Um, so I guess it's a balancing act there, mm. um, and I, I guess that's partly where where Gore's resistance came from as well. Mm. It's you know, for, for him, it's not about him. Yeah, <laughs> it's about all of us, and it's about well, and that comes yeah. out in the second one because yeah. he, he's going to show. He shows up on MSNBC, yes, and he's got the young journalist who's saying, "Well, this is what we're going to talk about," and he keeps saying, "We're going to talk about climate." He goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, no, we'll talk about climate, <laughs> but we're also going to talk about 2016." He goes, "I don't have anything to say about that," <laughs> and I forget how, the, how politics has changed. He goes, "Well, yeah, but I'm not talking about that either. I, we're going. I want to talk about climate." You know, yes, and of course they ask about 2016 and the public, <laughs> you know, the field. Of course, yeah. of course, yeah. I mean, and that's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. The challenge is how to keep it on topic. Um, and you know, the broader trend, one might say, in commercially successful documentary have been those that have been able to mobilize compelling performances and yeah. and, and kind of charismatic persona. Mm. Um, and there's an, a, an understanding of that and an understanding of how that's one way to kind of draw in audiences. Mm. You have to have that strong performance, that yeah. compelling persona. But at the same time, you know, the risk is <laughs> um, that you're yeah. going to go too far the other way, yeah. actually, and lose sight of what it is that you're trying to deliver to the audience. But at the same time, because you're saying, you, you know, you're talking about this effective use of the, uh, the this, uh, mm. scene in Paris in the second film, um, you know, Maybe the flip side of this is that you does is putting the audience in danger, if you will, or at least right there with Gore and the danger, and and there's other moments through films mm. and this these and others. Is that also is that effective? Because maybe that is an effective tool. Uh, I know people said if you think about your earliest childhood memories, the ones you think about, you may not even think of it now as an adult, but at the time you thought you're often the ones that are most vivid are the ones where you thought you were in danger. You're going to yes. fall out of that tree or you're going to, you know, that kind of thing. Yes, yes. I think that's true, isn't it? And I think there's there's a lot of the work on research, the research, sorry, on risk, yeah. which is about precisely those things, those things that are kind of vivid and and you can recall them. And yeah. they are kind of key events 
that stick in your mind and they kind of resonate for you. And I think that's those moments that the film uses from Gore's own past. They are things mm. that are moments of kind of acute risk, one might say, yeah. acute personal risk that uh, remain vivid and compelling in his memory. That's a good point. Because he even mentions the uh, totaling the car. Yes. When he was 14. Now, yeah. I don't think you could drive a car, even in when Gore's time, you could drive a car <laughs> when you're 14. You had to be 15 to get a, a permit and then 16 to actually get a license. Yeah. So who yeah. knows what he was up to. Yes, but, yes. Yeah. Um, but the other point I think that your, that your question kind of spoke to is the idea of um, vicarious risk yeah. as well. The okay. idea that, and that's something that good yeah. documentary yeah. can deliver, that experience of vicarious risk. And we tend to think of this as being a feature more of, say, extreme sports documentaries. Yeah. And that's part of the thrill of an extreme sports documentary is you know, being there as they're hanging off yeah. the cliff edge. Well, we were going to actually, we'll jump ahead. I mean, I, yeah. one thing I wanted to say is, you know, we we're going to probably talk, we're well, not talk about it, but yeah. reference Free Solo. So mm. best documentary film in 2018, very much. I, I hold my hands up. I haven't actually seen it yet, but everyone else tells me they had their, actually most of the time had their heads in their head in their hands because they were just so afraid. Someone said they, someone told me that she, she had to run off. She almost got sick from watching this. Um, it, it is, it is a staggering yeah. um, undertaking, you know, to be walk, to be climbing all the way up El Capitan yeah. with, with yeah. no ropes, you know, and just, and every moment you think he's going to slip. You know, his finger's not going to wedge in that little kind of crevice. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it's, it's, yeah. you know, it's nail biting stuff. Absolutely. So would you say, uh, uh, Inconvenient Truths, one of the, is it the first really that, or first successful, I guess, that used this sort of, uh, using performance to, to, to talk about, you know, to deal with risk? I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't say it's the, the first, um, I mean, I think, what what I see is the beginning of a wave of documentaries, which really, I think, triangulate these thi this kind of yeah. idea of documentary performance and risk. Um, for me, at least, within an American documentary mm -hmm. context, is Roger the Me, which is Michael Moore's yeah. breakout film. Right. Um, and you know that's about a different kind of risk, which is about um, um, the the risk to financial welfare. Based mm. on um, mm. you know, kind of uh, deindustrialization de within America, right. and the idea that you no longer have good, you know, unionized, secure employment. Interesting. Um, and and more that obviously he is the son of a GM auto, auto worker, 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 right? Yeah. Um, you know, but he puts himself in the middle of that issue yeah. um, and tries to sort of understand it, and and it's his kind of personality, and you know, it's called. Roger the me, <laughs> Roger and me, Roger and, me yeah. uh, and, and you know, it's about him in the middle of that issue. Yeah. Um, and the contrast, I guess, between him and his father, right? So he, his father is the, the auto part worker. He is the kind of the, the, the kind of the, the post-industrial worker who's using knowledge. And, yeah, um, yeah. But his father would have had the good, good factory job, was probably able to buy a decent house right. back when Flint was a place people wanted to live. Yes. And uh, it probably has a good pension. Yes, that will we'll use that as our uh, the pension reference. We use, we always usually have a a Paul Brennan salesman reference with that for those keeping score at home with your Paul Brennan score sheets that will count <laughs> as our reference for today. Um, but are these? I mean, you mentioned Roger and me. I mean, is this something that's? Is this? I mean, it's it's. I'm sure it's spread throughout the world. But is this is this uniquely an American sort of art form, or it has its roots there? Would you? Would you say? I, mean, I don't think it's uniquely American. Um, I mean, listeners who are more familiar with other areas of mm. documentary making might be able to point out other examples that yeah. really fit this model well. Um, so I don't think it's uniquely American. I think what it is, is American documentary has been very successful yeah. at mobilizing this, actually. Okay. Um, and it's part, of a, it's part of a wider trend, I think, within what we'd broadly call American independent film okay. and how American independent film as an area of cultural production really became more commercial from the 1980s onwards mm. by doing a number of things. One was to kind of focus more clearly on specific genres, yeah. to focus much more clearly on uh, compelling psychologically rounded characters yeah. um, and to focus on kind of gripping narratives. Mm. Um, and so I think American independent documentary did that as well. I think, and, and a lot of American independent documentaries that have done well deploy those elements successfully. I, I think that le leads us to 
today, and we've already mentioned Free Solo. Yes. Um, so this seems to be here to stay, doesn't it? I mean, um, oh, or is, has there even been any, is there any backlash against this? This sort of... I mean, I, I think I think one of the questions which exercises uh, documentary scholars and documentary critics, okay. particularly with um, work which seeks to... Um, create change, I mm. think, and whether is how do you do that with documentary? It's one thing to compel an audience, to excite an audience, to energize an audience, but how do you then get them to leave the theater or get up from their sofa after watching it on Netflix and make a difference? Mm. And I think that's where things become much more difficult, actually. Yeah. Things become much more difficult. How do you move from a documentary which makes a compelling argument? to an audience which takes that argu argument and goes somewhere with it. Yeah. Actually, it becomes the kind of the advocates for that particular issue and that topic. It's, it's interesting because I think there's even in the in the first uh first of the uh uh of the films Al Gore actually makes sort of makes reference to this. He says something about, you know, despair can lead to an action and things like that, but don't despair. Don't despair. And then he takes a different that second you know, it's 10 years on you could argue I'm more a glass half empty sort of person, I think. Uh, at the second film, you can say, look, what has been achieved in the last 10 years, that temperatures keep going up, nothing's happening. But he's all positive. He's positive about what's happening with solar energy uh, and other renewables. He's got a bit of a skip in his step for someone who's approaching 70 at the time and who's now, I think, in his early 70s. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It is interesting. And, and, and I think where some of the most interesting work is appearing is in is in documentary that is interactive in format actually that where you're moving from documentary where you're just presenting an argument to an audience to content that's requiring that audience and asking that audience to engage more with the creation of that work and to become much more participatory and to become involved in the production of those ideas well that gets us to your documentary doesn't it i mean i uh I was looking at it on the uh, on the way down uh, earlier, and uh, you know, it's uh, ask you your age. I had to scroll down quite a bit to get there, but uh, <laughs> yes, we finally got there. Uh, I mean, this, it, so the content's tailored. If I had put I was born in 1985, it would have been a little different than it would have been a little different. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, here they're t they didn't ask me about you know was I afraid of falling from my z from my chair or zimmer frame <laughs> or anything, but uh, uh, but it's. Uh, so but you want to say some more about that? So how do you, you know? Sure, sure. So I mean. And, and, and let me interrupt. That's risktakersguide.com. Risktakersguide.com. It's yeah. an interactive documentary. Takes about 20 minutes to go yeah. through it. So, um, and it will sort of ask you questions, uh, pose problems and issues in relation to your own idea of risk. So what it's kind of set out, sets out to do there really is to kind of quantify how much of a risk taker you are actually. Um, and one of the reasons why me and the co-creators wanted to make this documentary is that we were, we felt that what was difficult to do in a theatrical documentary was talk about the things which actually concern most of us most frequently, which is kind of everyday risk. So, oh. you know, we might not be thinking about climate change. We might not be thinking about global financial crises. We might yeah. be thinking about much more small scale things that, right. that impact on us in our everyday lives. And that those kind of small scale risks, they're not really calibrated properly, dramatically enough to make a big screen documentary very easily or necessarily very successful commercially. But we thought interact an interactive format could really work with this because you can mm. you know you can do it on your tablet, you can do it on your phone. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes, yep, yep, yep. doesn't yep. take too long to do, not too much of your time. Um, and it will ask you questions about how you think about risk in your everyday life. Um, with a, with a, trying to get you to think about your your own sense of risk and your risk perception. I, I recommend you have a look, it's uh, risktakersguide.com. It's very, very well done. I think Thank it's you. very, uh, I, I've never done an interactive uh, doc or short, and so I, I definitely, uh, definitely really appreciate it. I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, these inconvenient truth, inconvenient sequel. Uh, yes, we know what it's about. It's about climate change mm. and uh, the risk to our environment and actually a bit of hope there that things are actually changing. Yes. Uh, but what other categories, I mean, what are some of the other 
other big issues that are being that you know use this sort of technique sure sure well i mean in in the book um i sort of talk about different sort of major categories of risk yeah. um as they are kind of being defined as global problems so yeah. you know in the book i talk about um the global financial crises right and the kind of the risks of financialization mm-hmm. um of, of the le- escalating levels of personal debt and so on and so yes. forth and in that in that chapter i use um michael moore's documentary um capitalism a love story okay and i talk about that and again i think the way that that film works is through having lots of individuals embody that risk and so it's about selling blood plasma or right. be, you know right. lots of different ways in which the, the the kind of the individual body becomes the kind of the focus around which this idea of in some ways it's a very sort of intangible risk you know the kind of did global financial markets and yeah. you know and, and algorithms and and all these kind of elements that you're hard to put your finger on so it's the way in which the, the that kind of risk impacts on individual bodies and individuals mm-hmm. um that i think that film really works very successfully around um i also talk about um the global obesity risk the idea right. of, of globesity yes. as it's often yeah. described yeah. um again you know another risk which is which is kind of wide widespread in scale um but affects the body and, and is very very much understood through different forms of embodiment okay and i mean i think it just it reminds me of a film we've actually uh, have discussed on this podcast mm-hmm. already the alex gibney's uh, the the inventor and that's uh we discussed well. It gets back to your financial risk and the American capitalism and Silicon Valley. But I mean, ultimately, it's about putting dodgy apparat- apparatuses into pharmacies mm. in mo- mostly in Arizona, and people getting uh, spurious uh, blood test results. Mm. Mm. And that's a there's a lot of risk there. So I guess personal risk, in, indeed, that this could be happening somewhere in in America. Uh, a company becomes worth nine billion dollars and yet uh it's all built on not even built on faulty sites not even built on science absolutely and i mean this i mean speaks to one of these you know one of the major kind of um i guess trends that i'm interested in which is that as these corporations get more powerful as the opportunities to kind of take these kind of risks occur yeah. it's in it's the individual that's often um right at the center of it and, and we're asked increasingly to make more and more decisions about the risks in our lives um as the kind of social safety nets kind of slip away we're asked to make those decisions mm-hmm. you know do we need to look after our health you know do have we got a fitbit are yeah. we making sure that we're you know kind yeah. of fit and healthy um have we have we invested properly for our future um you know we're, we're very much asked to take a, a lot more responsibility for the risks around us mm. um that kind of is that that sort of responsibility is really being kind of um placed on us yeah. um at the same time i think and this is i think what what makes our society so interesting is that um we're encouraged to take different sorts of risks as well yeah. we're encouraged to be risk takers and self actualization so you know to feel the fear and do it anyway mm. um you know if you don't take risks then you're never going to you're never going to kind of achieve yeah. your your kind of um your potential so it's really how we kind of we could think about both of those things a society in which we're kind of required to be risk averse and risk aware but also can take the right kinds of risks I I think on that note um um uh, I think that brings us to a very good 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 stopping point um and to say um you know and thank our uh, listeners out there thank you for uh, taking the risk of of downloading us and or watching us on YouTube so thank you very much uh, I want to thank our guest uh Dr. James Lyons for coming on board that was that, that was that was a great conversation really enjoyed it I uh, hope would love to have you on again sometime uh, we can discuss something uh, that's not so risky. I don't know. We'll find find something else. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure. Maybe you can tell us uh, where you know if people want to follow you. What uh, they're interested in your books. Uh, where what's the best way to kind of keep tabs on James Lyons? Well, the the new book, uh, documentary performance and risk, is available in all good booksellers. Um, I won't and say anything else? I won't say online, anything online. I gather as well. O- apparently online. Yes. Apparently. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. So so that's out there as yeah. well. Um, I'm relatively old school. I don't have a Twitter feed, I'm afraid, or Good Instagram. Yes. Yeah, no. Um but but the books out there and um and okay. I and I'd love to see what your readers think okay. of it. Well, I and 
Indeed, I hope our readers do reach out to us. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guest, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Alamo Pictures to be the first to hear about new productions, festivals we're attending, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.